This is the sixth in a series of short podcasts designed for the families of children with chromosome 18 abnormalities. In this podcast, we will explain in more detail about microarray analysis and what it can tell you and what it cannot. Microarray analysis allows you to detect very small chromosome copy number changes and to assess the entire genome in one experiment. This is how it works. It uses two DNA samples that are compared for their differences. One sample is the normal sample. In this case, it's labeled with a green fluorescent dye. The patient DNA sample is labeled with a red fluorescent dye. These two samples are then mixed together and placed on a microscope slide. This microscope slide has been specially prepared by the application of tens of thousands of microspots of DNA from known locations across the genome. The DNA in these spots are only 60 base pairs in length. This would be 1 350th of an inch on our football field. The DNA in this mix of normal and patient DNA then compete with each other to attach to those spots on the slide. Then the slide is scanned by a laser reader that measures the level of red and the level of green fluorescence attached to each of the microspots and compares their ratios. In the example shown here, every place at the end of the chromosome 18p arm, there are two green for every red. So more green will attach to those spots on the slide from the end of the p arm. And the spots in the slide will be more green than red. However, for the remainder of the chromosome, the red and green labeled DNA compete evenly to attach to the spots on the slide. The data from this experiment is shown to the right. The data points are shown at the position along chromosome 18 corresponding to the location of the DNA in the spot on the slide. When the normal and patient DNA samples have an even red-green ratio, the data points are aligned at or near the zero axis. Where there is a deletion and therefore more green than red, the data points are closer to the minus one axis. If there were a duplication, the data points would show more red than green and the data points would cluster closer to the plus one axis. In our laboratory, we use the Agilent Technology System. This is a slide from them showing actual data from a cancer tumor sample. In this example, you can see that there are two regions with deletions, the green dots, and one region with a duplication, the red dots. Their statistical analysis program labels the regions it considers abnormal using colored bars. In this case, the bar is blue. Here is a comparison of the resolution of this technique relative to the other chromosome analysis techniques that we've discussed. The left half of this picture shows the same diagram you've seen before. It depicts the end of the p-arm of chromosome 18. The yellow box indicates the smallest detectable change using cytogenetics. The white box on the right side is actual data from a microarray experiment from someone without a deletion of this region of the chromosome. So all the data points cluster around the zero axis. The red arrows point to the same genes in each diagram. This way, you can see they are aligned. So you can easily see the number of data points that could detect a deletion or duplication and how small such a change could be in comparison to a cytogenetic karyotype. The microarray data shown here is from a low-resolution array. Arrays can be produced with a density of data points that are at a density of more than 20 times what is shown here. This means that we can now detect very small changes in chromosome copy number. This is a software display of the microarray data. We can see if there are copy number changes anywhere in the genome from the panel on the left. Changes are indicated by the pink bar. We can zoom in on any single chromosome shown in the center panel. And we can zoom in on any region of an individual chromosome shown in the panel on the right. Although this is an amazing technology that can help us move the research forward at a much faster pace, this technology too has its limitations. All the data points are shown against the map of the chromosome. This is not a picture of the chromosome. This can be illustrated in this example. By now, you should be able to appreciate that the individual whose DNA is pictured here appears to have an interstitial deletion of chromosome 18. However, the microarray technique really only tells us about copy number changes. 
We really only know that this person is missing one copy of a section of chromosome 18 from the middle of the long arm. We do not know from this data where that piece of the chromosome from the bottom of the long arm that is in two copies actually resides. It could be translocated to a different chromosome, or it could be attached to the upper breakpoint of the abnormal copy of chromosome 18. We cannot determine the location of that segment from a microarray experiment. The only thing we can learn here is about the net copy number change. However, now that we know just what region of the chromosome we need to test, we can use FISH to determine the location of that chromosome segment. In the picture shown here, we used a green FISH probe for the chromosome 18 centromere in order to identify chromosome 18. We also used a red FISH probe to identify the end of 18Q. In this case, the end of 18Q is actually on chromosome 18, so the deletion is indeed interstitial. So in this case, both techniques, microarray and FISH, were necessary in order to fully characterize this individual's chromosome change. This ability to detect small deletions and duplications anywhere in the genome in a single experiment has had some unexpected consequences. Here's an example. We were using the microarray technology to look for people with very small, previously undetectable 18Q deletions. These children have a single feature often found in people with 18Q minus. In this study, we recruited children with dysmyelination of the brain and no other known syndrome. This child was found to have a small duplication of chromosome 3P. As a control for the experiment, we also performed the same microarray experiment on the DNA for this child's parents. We did this in order to correlate the dysmyelination in the child with a unique chromosome change in the child. However, this is what we found. The same region of chromosome 3P is shown in each panel. The child's result that you just saw is at the top panel. The parent's results are in the bottom panel. You can see that this child's father also has the 3P duplication. In this case, the father is a healthy and well-educated, normally functioning adult. Therefore, this chromosome 3P duplication is most likely not associated with dysmyelination and is considered a normal variant. Here is a region of chromosome 8P that does include genes and is commonly found to be in single copies in typically developing individuals. The implication for us is very significant in that not all chromosome copy number changes cause abnormal development or function. In a large study of children with developmental disabilities and karyotypically normal chromosomes, microarray analysis was used to look for small deletions or duplications. In this study, they used a different technique than we described here that was not as high a resolution, but it did cover the entire genome. Out of the 100 children in the study, 97 of them were found to have some sort of copy number change. In fact, some children had more than one copy number change because they detected a total of 258 copy number changes in those 97 children. So obviously, some children had more than one copy number change. However, only 10 children had new copy number changes that were not found in their parents. Of those, seven were deletions and three were duplications. So the conclusion is that almost everyone has a copy number difference. However, most are not associated with disease, even though they include genes. By now, I hope you have concluded that some genes do not have abnormal consequences when they are in some copy number other than two. But you could rightfully also conclude that some genes have major consequences when they are in an abnormal copy number, and some genes have minor consequences when they are in an abnormal copy number. Here's an example of two individuals with deletions of 18Q. The individual whose microarray result is shown on the left has a deletion that includes a single gene, yet this child is significantly developmentally delayed. The individual whose microarray result is on the right has a deletion that is 60 times bigger and includes 15 genes, yet this individual has an IQ that is well above average. This brings us to our fundamental challenge, to identify the key genes that cause a functional difference when they are present in an abnormal copy number.